On episode 210 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll experience a serve technique masterclass from elite tennis coach James Ludlow. Hey there, this is Mirabon, and welcome to another episode of the Tennis Files podcast. And I'm really excited for you to listen to this episode, and I'm excited myself to re listen to it because we're going to really dive super deep into serve technique, probably the deepest I've ever dove into the subject on the podcast, at least. And this time with certified tennis instructor at Online Tennis Instruction, James Ludlow. And if you've heard my podcast and summits before, and if not, welcome. I have interviewed some OTI instructors like Greg Lesur and Florian Mayer, and they're fantastic. And so today we talk about the struggles on the technical side of the serve, uh, how to improve your throwing motion, how important it is to be relaxed on the serve, platform versus pinpoint stances, how to improve your toss consistency, keys to a great second serve and a great kick serve the importance of avoiding over-rotation. These are amazingly important subjects on the serve. And again, I am going to be listening to this uh, at least once more and then uh, implementing where I need to, and you should be doing the same. And I hope you have some pieces of paper and a pen or two in case your first pen runs out of ink, always happens to me, to just take notes on this great information. So uh, with that, I'm going to kick it off to the interview. Uh, with James, who is just so passionate. And as you'll hear, he has dove deep into tennis technique and studied it for thousands of hours. So uh, without further ado, here is my interview with James Ludlow. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Tennis Falls podcast. It's a pleasure to have on James Ludlow on the podcast. And uh, he is one of the great instructors uh, in the online space, although obviously he teaches at clinics and so forth. But uh, I've come across his work on YouTube with online tennis instruction and really found his instruction fantastic, particularly on the serve. So I figured let's bring him on. The serve is a, a very important part of the game, if not the most important part. And so James has a lot of experience with that area of the game. So uh, James, thanks a lot for coming on to the podcast. Great to have you on. Yeah, I got to say, you pronounced my name right, the second name. So that's a good start. <laughs> huh, thank you. Yeah, it's funny. Actually, like as I was saying it, I, I was thinking like, am I going to say this correctly? <laughs> so uh, good, yeah, good, fantastic. Good. Uh, yeah, and we were talking about uh, Wales football a bit uh, before this, so that was fun. But James, uh, I always enjoy uh, getting to know how people got into the game. And you've actually had a very rapid progression thanks to your you know, thousands of hours studying, which we'll obviously get into. So how did you get your start playing tennis? Well, it was an interesting start, to say the least, up until the age of 14, late 14. Uh, I weren't interested in any sports. I wanted to be a baker, a chef. Uh, uh, and my father sat me down and showed me the highlights of the 2008 Wimbledon final between Rafa and Roger. And from that point, boom, I was hooked. I thought, okay, uh, yeah, I want to do tennis. And then I started playing. Nothing serious, just playing. I really loved the game. I had a passion for the game very quickly. Uh, went out to playing at the age of 14. Uh, and then a year later, I was surprised on my birthday uh, to a clinic with Florian. Uh, I went out there under the impression that I was a brilliant player. I was like, watch me impress this guy. It's going to be awesome. And I was quickly brought back down to earth. And <laughs> I realized I had zero technique on anything. Uh, but that's where I was introduced to tennis. It was that 2008 final. Uh, but from that point to boom, I love the game. Still love it now wow. after all these hours. <laughs> yeah, I, I can certainly see that in your videos. So at what level were you when you actually went to the OTI clinic? <sighs> like a very low level, let's say that. it was. Um, I was only been playing for just under a year at that point. Uh, nothing, Like I said, nothing serious. It was mainly just playing in the park with my father for example. And then we did do tournaments after that, uh, but I did it for maybe three or four years traveling around the tournaments. Uh, but I found that I'd never really enjoyed it. I didn't know what it was, but never really clicked for me. Uh, even when I won, I didn't get any sort of feeling from it. But what I always loved was technique. I have a very analytical brain and that's where I realized my passion really, really was uh, with the technique. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And so as I mentioned earlier, so you have spent thousands of hours studying the game. And I'm curious, like, do you have a particular methodology or system 
as far as, you know, studying the game? Because sometimes we can study a lot, but we, we, we don't retain, we don't learn. But obviously, you know, you've come to the point where you can teach, uh, the, the, you know, the proper techniques very well. So uh, did you have a system for your learning and application? Yeah, there was a, I always refer back to a Bruce Lee quote. He's one of my uh, role models. And he said, absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and then add what is uniquely your own. And I always followed that. So I was mainly put under the OTI system, the OTI methodology. That's my main study point. But then I was introduced to the people like uh, Vic Braden, uh, all these other coaches. I, since I tried to study as much of different sources as possible, and then what I do is I always have a notebook or a journal. I write everything down and then I just ask myself questions about it. Or, okay, how does this make sense to me? Does it apply to me? Uh, do I agree with this particular concept and so forth? Uh, but then the other main important thing was for me is to apply it in my own tennis. Since then, I know if it works or not. So when I'm learning, uh, I try and absorb as much information as possible. The things I like then, I say, okay, I'm going to go out and try it, test it, see what, how it applies to me. Uh, and then from there, that's how I've been able to build sort of systems on how to apply technique and so forth and help other players with it. So cool, James. And so I, I guess you kind of described it here for my next question, but I was curious how you, you know, the process for um, discarding information. So say you take a lesson and somebody, you know, tells you X, Y, Z, and then, you know, you're able to discern that it's not applicable to your game. So how do you go about doing that? Well, it started to come with more experience. When I started to study, for example, the OTI methodology, Vic Braden and so forth, then I could, the more experience I built in the game, the more I could decipher the, let's say, efficient and inefficient way of teaching. I never say there's a, a wrong or right way. You can do anything, but there's efficient and inefficient. Uh, so then I just, the more experience I got in the game, I started to realize, okay, this, for example, if players are teaching, uh, the stop and the motion and so forth, I started realizing that that's not an optimal way to do it. There's a better way to do it. You can do it that way. Uh, but for me, I'd say personally, the way I deciphered that information was simply due to the more experience I had in the coaching industry. So, Gotcha. That makes sense, James. I, I've, I recently saw, uh, I guess, an, obviously an older video of, of Vic Braden and uh, talking about pronation and, and you know, how, where the um, palm should be facing, you know, after you strike the ball. So uh, I was wondering, like, what are, you know, one or two of the biggest um, uh, takeaways that you got from uh, from Vic Braden's teachings, if you can remember? One of the biggest, I, th I tell you, one of the ones that really uh, stood out to me, uh, two of them, actually. Um, the first one is he talks about the, the use of the legs in the serve. And even mm -hmm. when I was first started off in the game, I was under the impression myself that in order to generate a lot of power, I should jump on the serve, really try and use the lower body. Uh, and I always remember watching a video where he had players jump on a trampoline and try and hit the serve. Uh, and mm -hmm. you initially, you think, wow, they're going to get a lot of power, but they actually lost up to 50% of the power by using the trampoline since now all the stabilizers are gone. They've got no foundation to hit off. Uh, and that was a real eye-opener for me. That was a big one. Since then, I realized from that point that, okay, the legs are very important, but the arm mechanics are extremely important. They probably give you 80% of the results, and the legs give you around 20%. And then the second one for me was the ball toss. He did a study on the height of the ball toss, uh, and people often think to give themselves more time, they toss the ball very high. Uh, but he did the study that a higher ball is falling faster, so it's in the strike zone for a much shorter period of time. A lower ball toss remains in the racket head for a much longer period of time. And that was an eye-opener for me also. Those two things were really big for me. Yeah, really fantastic stuff. I mean, was certainly, you know, you can use all the legs you want, but if you don't have the the throwing motion intact, which, you know, has been a tough for me to, to integrate properly as well, uh, then you're not going to have a great serve. And yeah, yeah. A lot of great points there. Um, appreciate that. So, um, the serve, let, let's dive deep into that. I think that's what we're going to be doing this episode for the most part. So, um, what part of the serve, you know, in working with amateur players, which you all do a great job at at OTI, um, you know, I, I recently hit with, with Greg, as we were talking about before the show, and he's fantastic. I've had him on my summits and he's a great player, you know, very high level as well. Got, uh, you know, ATP point, um, and then Florian over there. Uh, and you have, uh, some others as well. Uh, Nadim, I think I was just watching a video from him on the toss. 
So uh, what part of the serve do amateur players struggle with the most from what you've seen? For me, it's I probably do around five to 10 reviews every day of different students on a serve. Mm. And the most common problem we see uh, for myself is what we call the open racket face. So throughout mm. the swing, they open up the palm and the strings. And as soon as they do that, they now hinder their ability to get into what we call the racket drop. That's a major power position on the serve. Pre-stretches the shoulder muscles, the forearm muscles, and so forth. But as soon as we open up the racket face, it not only hinders your ability for the racket drop, but it does put a necessary strain on the shoulder joint. And that's a very common problem. And the question you got to ask is, why does it happen? Very natural. It's because our brain, what's the most logical thing to do? We want to point the strings to the ball. Because we want to make contact with the ball. But if you actually look at the best players in the world in slow motion, the strings are not pointing to the ball until the very last second, until they make contact. Uh, and that's why I do believe that the tennis, the serve, is probably the most difficult shot to master in all sports. Very uh, dysfunctional for the brain. It doesn't make sense to the brain. But what I will say is to all you guys watching, once you master it, uh, it's a very great feeling to know that you can hit a good serve. So, yeah. But that's the most common thing, the open racket face, I would say for me. Yeah, yeah, I see that a lot with amateurs. So what is the solution or solutions to that problem? Well, the best thing I can uh, give advice for players is, first of all, break it down. That's the first step. Uh, but the key that they have to master is what we call that right-to-left arm action. If they can get into what we call a half-serve position, the half-serve position is basically where the elbow is just below shoulder level, tip of the racket points to what would be the right-side fence if you're a right-handed player. And when you're in that position, you just want to make sure that the palm and the strings are pointed relatively down towards the ground. That's the first key. And then if they can get the racket moving in a right to left manner by bending from the elbow, the best analogy I can give of it is just imagine you're saluting like the soldiers do in the army. If you can get that going where the knuckles remain pointed to the sky, the palm pointing down, if they get that going, everything else will start to fall into place. But that's the main key for fixing it. And then if you want to go creative, then you can use like the bottle drill, for example. So you get the bottle of water, you fill the water bottle up. I've got a big bottle here. It's not going to work with this. <laughs> but the idea is you fill it up so you have just a quarter of water in the bottle. And then you bend from the elbow, move it right to left over the head. And the key for you is to keep the water in the bottom of the bottle. If you open up the palm, the water will go to the top of the bottle. And that's when you know that you've done it incorrectly. But the best, the best way to just focus on it, just imagine that you're saluting. Like the soldiers do in the army, it's that same action, just like so. And then you just add the racket, same thing. Very nice, James. I think since we're recording this on Saturday night, I might try that with uh, one-fourth of gin in the bottle, you know, and then just <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great one. Really appreciate that. So, uh, you know, that's once we do that, too, I still do see players, even though they have a pretty decent right-to-left I guess the racket drop still, you know, they have issues with that, getting the depth there. And so, I mean, I imagine, you know, some of that's due to tightness as well, but like, how can we achieve a better racket drop, whether that's technical or even, you know, mobility exercise, like anything, like what have, what have you seen helps with that? Yeah. There's a great point you said about mobility. That's the first thing that you have to be aware of. You don't want to force the racket drop uh, since you're not, I'm not aware of your shoulder uh, health and condition. So just be aware yeah. of that. Uh, but one thing I do always say to players is we show them the optimal racket drop, which would be along the right side of the body, uh, the tip of the racket around hip level, depending on the shoulder flexibility. That's the optimal racket drop. But what I always say to players is you don't need to achieve that racket drop. You don't need to have it picture perfect. All you got to do is work within your own limitations. So even if you can get it uh, just 3 or 4% better than what it already is, you're going to see an improvement in the effortless power on the serve. But how do you do that? How do you get into a better racket drop? Well, there's several several drills you can do. One brilliant one is we call it the elbow, the ball drill. So you would toss the ball up and you would try and have the ball fall onto your elbow. Now, naturally, that puts you into that racket drop position. And then you may be asking, okay, but how do I progress that with a ball? How do I start hitting the ball? Well, what you do is you basically trick the brain. So you do two where you elbow the ball. On the third one, you would toss the ball up and you just make a conscious effort on elbowing the ball, but the last second you swing up to contact. Now it's going to feel very weird, very strange in the beginning. You'll most likely miss hit, miss hit the ball, but that's completely normal. That's fine. Uh, but that will really start to get the racket falling down and away from the body into that racket drop as soon as you get that feeling. 
And what I think the elbow of the ball drill is so excellent because you can have players stop in that position. And now they get a visual idea of what that racket drop should actually look like also. And having that visual uh, picture in your mind for what it should look like, it's also very, very beneficial for players. Yeah, I can definitely vouch for that drill because I, I watched one of your videos um, with that drill and I did it and it definitely helped my uh, my power on the serve. So that I'm glad you brought that in one up. Some more questions on the serve. So I know obviously, you know, there's great servers who execute the platform stance, you know, both feet apart and they don't move forward or the back one doesn't move forward. And then, you know, you've got the pinpoint where the back foot moves forward and other mishmashes of that. So um, how do you go about recommending one versus the other to players? Is there any like bodily characteristics of people where you say, oh, you know, maybe the pinpoint is better for you or vice versa? Well, the main thing that comes down to the discussion about stances for us when we're talking about technique is let's say there's a player who's maybe you want to work on your arm mechanics. Um, then we refer to the platform stance because that's the easiest stance to use when you're learning other techniques. Trying to coordinate the pinpoint along with other mechanics can be difficult. But with that be in mind, if the pinpoint stance works for you, uh, then by all means, don't change it. As the saying goes, if it ain't if it if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. That's the, that's the saying. Uh, but of course, the there are benefits to both stances. Which one is better? Me personally, I use the platform stance. I uh, just a personal preference. But with players, if I find the player is having a very hard time coordinating the ball toss, the mechanics, all this kind of stuff, then I'd recommend okay, let's let's just break it down. Just work from a platform stance. Uh, but as you advance, if you want to move to a pinpoint, then for sure, that's definitely a possibility. But Federer, one of the greatest servers of all time, uses that platform. So, <laughs> yeah, that is true. Is it, I mean, is it true that uh, pinpoint stance uh, players can get higher up or anything? Like, is there any validity to that or not? Does it matter? Well, the, the idea, it doesn't really matter, but the idea is I remember studying this. Basically, the pinpoint, I, I'm trying to think where it gives you. The platform, I there's like a way, let me try, I'm trying to jog my memory now. There's so many stuff I've learned over the years, but there was a benefit yeah. to both stances. But I believe the pinpoint stance either allows you to go more into the court, the platform stance drives you more up. Um, but yeah, I to be honest with you on that question, on the pinpoint, I would have to do more studying again on that before I give a mm -hmm. valid answer since I don't want to give any misinformation to viewers. Right. That's very important to me. So, uh, yeah, I'd have to study more on that particular thing. Sure. Yeah, that's that makes sense, James. So so with the toss, I mean, uh, and, and I was also watching a video on that too. I mean, that's so important. And, I, you know, I was playing at a, a tennis social the other day and, uh, you know, some questions on that from the players. So um, how do you recommend that we improve our toss consistency? What can we do with it uh, for that? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. If you don't have a good ball toss, everything else is out the window. Right. But uh, yeah, the I think the main key, the main key you've got to understand on the ball toss is we want to try and simplify the process. Uh, what you see amongst many players, they have a lot of um, factors of which things can break down. What I mean by that is, let's say, for example, a player has a bend in the toss and arm. When they have that bend, as you can see there, now it's uh, much easier for them to activate the other moving joint, which would be the elbow and the wrist. So now uh, some players, for example, straighten the arm at the release. Other players activate the wrist and the swing. So to eliminate that, what I'd recommend is, first of all, having a straight toss knot. So you have a straight arm. And by doing that, then you've simplified the process since all you have to do is lift that arm as a unit from the shoulder in a smooth manner. So now it becomes much more easy for players to try and to coordinate. That's the first step. Now, the second step is a lot of players uh, have the basically the idea in mind that they want to throw the ball up there, throw it up. But I try and have them I, I have the idea of placing the ball up there. So it's a very smooth and relaxed manner. Uh, and the that come down to the straight out tossing on them. What I'd recommend players do is even if they're watching this right now, stand up, start with the arm straight, touching your near your hip very in a low position. And just lift the arm as a unit from the shoulder in a smooth manner. And you can do it with a ball. Just lift the arm up to a point where the shoulder is touching the chin. Just lift it up. And when you're in this position, main, check to see if you've maintained that straight tossing arm. 
and just do that over and over again and feel how it's a relaxed movement. There's no jerky, sudden uh, movement in there. A lot of players have that since they start too high with the tossing arm. Uh, but that's the main thing. Number one, have that straight tossing arm. Number two, lift the arm in a smooth manner from the shoulder, maintaining that straight tossing arm. And that's really, really helped me when I was on the surf, working on the ball toss. Great stuff, James. And yeah, I guess on average, it seems like a lot of players are just tossing it too quickly. So would you maybe suggest that players kind of be as mm, maybe slow, like slow as possible or, or something like that? Or Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. A lot of players have a mistake with the surface rhythm. Um, so they start the motion too fast. When you start it too fast, the ball usually ends up going too high, much harder to control. So that's a great point, yes. If you start the motion slower, it gives you a lot more control on the ball toss and also it helps you with the other components of the swim if you start slower. Awesome. Thanks, James. And then, so I guess, again, it's, you know, it's somewhat stylistic, but obviously it carries implications. So in terms of, you know, bringing both arms, both the tossing and the hitting arms up together versus having some lag where you keep the uh, hitting arm, uh, I guess, like down a little bit lower and it comes up like uh, after the, the tossing arm. Like what, what do you suggest like in terms of like the, the simplest one that facilitates the best serve? Uh, for me, I promote more of that separation between them both. So you mm. toss the ball first and you delay the hitting arm. I just find that some players, when they have both arms going up at the same time, that's when things become very jerky and sudden. They move the racket too fast. Uh, and that results usually in a pause in the motion. The racket has to stop now since it's moving too fast. Um, so for me, I promote more of tossing the ball first and then initiating the swing. So what we say is after you've released the ball, so you release the ball approximately eye level, after you release, then you initiate the right to left from that point. You initiate the swing. That's what we usually teach players. Mm, I like that. Very simple and effective. Uh, and, and then I guess talking more about the role of the lower body, I um, mean, you know, obviously it can help a lot and, and, you know, with the unit turn, it's important to, to utilize it as well. So I guess, can you kind of describe like the main roles of, of the lower body with the surf? Yeah. Well, the, the first thing I'd um, have players uh, have in mind is when we talk a lot, a lot about jumping uh, on the serve, you want to jump for more power. Uh, I think more, on episode 210 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll experience a serve technique masterclass from elite tennis coach, James Ludlow. Hey there, this is Mirbon, and welcome to another episode of the Tennis Files podcast. And I'm really excited for you to listen to this episode, and I'm excited myself to re-listen to it because we're going to really dive super deep into serve technique, probably the deepest I've ever dove into the subject on the podcast at least. And this time with certified tennis instructor at Online Tennis Instruction, James Ludlow. And if you've heard my podcast and summits before, and if not, welcome. I have interviewed some OTI instructors like Greg Lesur and Florian Mayer, and they're fantastic. And so today we talk about the struggles on the technical side of the serve, uh, how to improve your throwing motion, how important it is to be relaxed on the serve platform versus pinpoint stances, how to improve your toss consistency, keys to a great second serve and a great kick serve, the importance of avoiding over rotation. These are amazingly important subjects on the serve. And again, I am going to be listening to this uh, at least once more and then uh, implementing where I need to, and you should be doing the same. And I hope you have some pieces of paper and a pen or two in case your first pen runs out of ink, always happens to me to just take notes on this great information. So uh, with that, I'm going to kick it off to the interview uh, with James, who is just so passionate. And as you'll hear, he has dove deep into tennis technique and studied it for thousands of hours. So uh, without further ado, here is my interview with James Ludlow. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Tennis Files podcast. It's a pleasure to have on James Ludlow on the podcast. And uh, he is one of the great instructors uh, in the online space, although obviously he teaches at clinics and so forth. But uh, I've come across his work on YouTube with online tennis instruction and really found his instruction fantastic, particularly on the serve. So I figured let's bring him on. The serve is a 
a very important part of the game, if not the most important part. And so James has a lot of experience with that area of the game. So, uh, James, thanks a lot for coming on to the podcast. Great to have you on. Yeah, I got to say you pronounced my name right, the second name. So that's a good start. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it's funny. Actually, like as I was saying it, I, I was thinking like, am I going to say this correctly? <laughs> so uh, good, good, yeah, fantastic. Good. Uh, yeah, and we were talking about uh, Wales football a bit uh, before this. So that was fun. But James, uh, I always enjoy uh, getting to know how people got into the game. And you've actually had a very rapid progression thanks to your you know, thousands of hours studying, which we'll obviously get into. So how did you get your start playing tennis? Well, it was an interesting start, to say the least, up until the age of 14, late 14. Uh, I weren't interested in any sports. I wanted to be a baker, a chef. Uh, uh, and my father sat me down and showed me the highlights of the 2008 Wimbledon final between Rafa and Roger. And from that point, boom, I was hooked. I thought, okay, yeah, I want to do tennis. And then I started playing Nothing serious, just playing. I really loved the game. I had a passion for the game very quickly. Uh, went out to playing at the age of 14. Uh, and then a year later, I was surprised on my birthday uh, to a clinic with Florian. Uh, I went out there under the impression that I was a brilliant player. I was like, watch me impress this guy. It's going to be awesome. And I was quickly brought back down to earth. And <laughs> I realized I had zero technique on anything. Uh, but that's where I was introduced to tennis. It was that 2008 final. Uh, but from that point to boom, I love the game. Still love it now wow. after all these hours. <laughs> yeah, I, I can certainly see that in your videos. So at what level were you when you actually went to the OTI clinic? <sighs> like a very low level, let's say that. It was, um, I was only been playing for just under a year at that point. Uh, nothing, like I said, nothing serious. It was mainly just playing in the park with my father, for example. And then we did do tournaments after that. Uh, but I did it for maybe three or four years, traveling around the tournaments. Uh, but I found that I'd never really enjoyed it. I didn't know what it was, but never really clicked for me. Uh, even when I won, I didn't get any sort of feeling from it. But what I always loved was technique. I have a very analytical brain, and that's where I realized my passion really, really was uh, with the technique. Yeah, very cool, very cool. And so, as I mentioned earlier, so you have spent thousands of hours studying the game. And I'm curious, like, do you have a particular methodology or system as far as, you know, studying the game? Because sometimes we can study a lot, but we, we, we don't retain, we don't learn. But obviously, you know, you've come to the point where you can teach, uh, the, the, you know, the proper techniques very well. So uh, did you have a system for your learning and application? Yeah, there was a, I always refer back to a Bruce Lee quote. He's one of my uh, role models. And he said, absorb what is useful, discard what is useless, and then add what is uniquely your own. And I always followed that. So I was mainly put under the OTI system, the OTI methodology. That's my main study point. But then I was introduced to the people like uh, Vic Braden, uh, all these other coaches. I, since I tried to study as much of different sources as possible. And then what I do is I always have a notebook or a journal. I write everything down and then I just ask myself questions about it. Or, okay, how does this make sense to me? Does it apply to me? Uh, do I agree with this particular concept and so forth? Uh, but then the other main important thing was for me is to apply it in my own tennis since then I know if it works or not. So when I'm learning, uh, I try and absorb as much information as possible. The things I like then, I say, okay, I'm going to go out and try it, test it, see what, how it applies to me. Uh, and then from there, that's how I've been able to build sort of systems on how to apply technique and so forth and help other players with it. So cool, James. And so I, I guess you kind of described it here for my next question, but I was curious how you, you know, the process for um, discarding information. So say you take a lesson and somebody, you know, tells you X, Y, Z, and then, you know, you're able to discern that it's not applicable to your game. So how do you go about doing that? Well, it started to come with more experience. When I started to study, for example, the OTI methodology, Vic Braden and so forth, then I could, the more experience I built in the game, the more I could decipher the, let's say, efficient and inefficient way of teaching. I never say there's a, a wrong or right way. You can do anything, but there's efficient and inefficient. Uh, so then I just, the more experience I got in the game, I started to realize, okay, this, for example, if players are teaching, uh, the stop and the motion and so forth, I started realizing that that's not an optimal way to do it. There's a better way to do it. You can do it that way. Uh, but for me, I'd say personally, 
the way I deciphered that information was simply due to the more experience I had in the coaching industry. So. Gotcha. That makes sense, James. I, I've, I recently saw, a, a, I guess, an, obviously an older video of, of Vic Braden and uh, talking about pronation and, and, you know, where the um, palm should be facing, you know, after you strike the ball. So uh, I was wondering, like, what are, you know, one or two of the biggest um, uh, takeaways that you got from, uh, from Vic Braden's teachings, if you can remember? One of the biggest, I, th- I tell you, one of the ones that really uh, stood out to me, uh, two of them, actually. Um, the first one is he talks about the, the use of the legs in the serve. And even mm-hmm. when I was first started off in the game, I was under the impression myself that in order to generate a lot of power, I should jump on the serve, really trying to use the lower body. Uh, and I always remember watching a video where he had players jump on a trampoline and try and hit the serve. Uh, and mm-hmm. you initially, you think, wow, they're going to get a lot of power, but they actually lost up to 50% of the power by using the trampoline since now all the stabilizers are gone. They've got no foundation to hit off. Uh, and that was a real eye opener for me. That was a big one. Since then, I realized from that point that, okay, the legs are very important, but the arm mechanics are extremely important. They probably give you 80% of the results and the legs give you around 20%. And then the second one for me was the ball toss. He did a study on the height of the ball toss. Uh, and people often think to give themselves more time, they toss the ball very high. Uh, but he did the study that a higher ball is falling faster. So it's in the strike zone for a much shorter period of time. A lower ball toss remains in the racket head for a much longer period of time. And that was an eye opener for me also. Those two things were really big for me. Yeah, really fantastic stuff. I mean, it was certainly, you know, you can use all the legs you want, but if you don't have the the throwing motion intact, which, you know, has been a tough for me to, to integrate properly as well, uh, then you're not going to have a great serve. And yeah, yeah. A lot of great points there. Um, appreciate that. So, um, the serve, let, let's dive deep into that. I think that's what we're going to be doing this episode for the most part. So, um, what part of the serve, you know, in working with amateur players, which you all do a great job at at OTI, um, you know, I, I recently hit with, with Greg, as we were talking about before the show, and he's fantastic. I've had him on my summits and he's a great player, you know, very high level as well. Got, uh, you know, ATP point, um, and then Florian over there. Uh, and you have, uh, some others as well. Uh, Nadim, I think I was just watching a video from him on the toss. So, uh, what part of the serve do amateur players struggle with the most uh, from what you've seen? For me, it's I probably do around five to 10 reviews every day of different students on the serve. Mm. And the most common problem we see uh, for myself is what we call the open racket face. So throughout mm. the swing, they open up the palm and the strings. And as soon as they do that, they now hinder their ability to get into what we call the racket drop. That's a major power position on the serve. It pre-stretches the shoulder muscles, the forearm muscles and so forth. But as soon as we open up the racket face, it not only hinders your ability for the racket drop, but it does put a necessary strain on the shoulder joint. And that's a very common problem. And the question you've got to ask is, why does it happen? Very natural. It's because our brain, what's the most logical thing to do? We want to point the strings to the ball. We want to make contact with the ball. But if you actually look at the best players in the world in slow motion, the strings are not pointing to the ball until the very last second, until they make contact. Uh, and that's why I do believe that the tennis, the serve is probably the most difficult shot to master in all sports. Very uh, dysfunctional for the brain. It doesn't make sense to the brain. But what I will say is to all you guys watching, once you master it, uh, it's a very great feeling to know that you can hit a good serve. So, yeah. But that's the most common thing, the open racket face, I would say for me. Yeah. Yeah. I see that a lot with amateurs. So what is the solution or solutions to that problem? Well, The best thing I can uh, give advice for players is, first of all, break it down. That's the first step. Uh, But the key that they have to master is what we call that right to left arm action. If they can get into what we call a half serve position, the half serve position is basically where the elbow is just below shoulder level, tip of the racket points to what would be the right side fence if you're a right-handed player. And when you're in that position, you just want to make sure that the palm and the strings are pointing relatively down towards the ground. That's the first key. And then if they can get the racket moving in a right to left manner by bending from the elbow, the best analogy I can give of it is just imagine you're saluting like the soldiers do in the army. If you can get that going where the knuckles remain pointed to the sky, the palm pointing down, if they get that going, everything else will start to fall into place. But that's the main key for fixing it. And then 
If you want to go creative, then you can use like the bottle drill, for example. So you get the bottle of water, you fill the water bottle up. I've got a big bottle here. It's not going to work with this. <laughs> but the idea is you fill it up so you have just a quarter of water in the bottle. And then you bend from the elbow, move it right to left over the head. And the key for you is to keep the water in the bottom of the bottle. If you open up the palm, the water will go to the top of the bottle. And that's when you know that you've done it incorrectly. But the best, the best way to just focus on it, just imagine that you're saluting. Like the soldiers doing the army, it's that same action, just like so. And then you just add the racket, same thing. Very nice, James. I think since we're recording this on Saturday night, I might try that with uh, one fourth of gin in the bottle, you know, and then just <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's a that's a great one. Really appreciate that. So uh, you know, that's once we do that too. I still do see players, even though they have a pretty decent right to left. I guess the racket drop still, you know, they have issues with that getting the depth there. And so, I mean, I imagine, you know, some of that's due to tightness as well, but like, how can we achieve a better racket drop, whether that's technical or even, you know, mobility exercise, like anything, like what have, what have you seen helps with that? Yeah, there's a great point you said about mobility. That's the first thing that you have to be aware of. You don't want to force the racket drop. Uh, since you're not, I'm not aware of your shoulder uh, health and condition. So just be aware of that. Uh, but one thing I do always say to players is we show them the optimal racket drop, which would be along the right side of the body, uh, the tip of the racket around hip level, depending on the shoulder flexibility. That's the optimal racket drop. But what I always say to players is you don't need to achieve that racket drop. You don't need to have it picture perfect. All you got to do is work within your own limitations. So even if you can get it uh, just 3 or 4% better than what it already is, you're going to see an improvement in the effortless power on the serve. But how do you do that? How do you get into a better racket drop? Well, there's several, several drills you can do. One brilliant one is we call it the elbow, the ball drill. So you would toss the ball up and you would try and have the ball fall onto your elbow. Now, naturally, that puts you into that racket drop position. And then you may be asking, okay, but how do I progress that with a ball? How do I start hitting the ball? Well, what you do is you basically trick the brain. So you do two where you elbow the ball. On the third one, you would toss the ball up and you just make a conscious effort on elbowing the ball, but the last second you swing up to contact. Now it's going to feel very weird, very strange in the beginning. You'll most likely miss hit, miss hit the ball, but that's completely normal. That's fine. Uh, but that will really start to get the racket falling down and away from the body into that racket drop as soon as you get that feeling. And what I think the elbow the ball drill is so excellent because you can have players stop in that position, and now they get a visual idea of what that racket drop should actually look like also. And having that visual a uh, picture in your mind for what it should look like. It's also very, very beneficial for players. Yeah, I can definitely vouch for that drill because I, I watched one of your videos um, <laughs> with that drill and I did it and it definitely helped my uh, my power on the serve. So that I'm glad you brought that one up. Tell more questions on the serve. So I know obviously, you know, there's great servers who execute the platform stands, you know, both feet apart and they don't move forward or the back one doesn't move forward. And then, you know, you've got the pinpoint where the back foot moves forward and other mishmashes of that. So um, how do you go about recommending one versus the other to players? Is there any like bodily characteristics of people where you say, oh, you know, maybe the pinpoint is better for you or vice versa? Well, the main thing that comes down to the discussion about stances for us when we're talking about technique is let's say there's a player who's maybe you want to work on your arm mechanics. Um, then we refer to the platform stance because that's the easiest stance to use when you're learning other techniques. Trying to coordinate the pinpoint along with other mechanics can be difficult. But with that be in mind, if the pinpoint stance works for you, uh, then by all means, don't change it. As the saying goes, if it ain't, if it, if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. That's the, that's the saying. Uh, but of course, the, there are benefits to both stances. Which one is better? Me personally, I use the platform stance. Uh, just a personal preference. But with players, if I find the player is having a very hard time coordinating the ball toss, the mechanics, all this kind of stuff, then I'd recommend, okay, let's, let's just break it down. Just work from a platform stance. Uh, but as you advance, if you want to move to a pinpoint, then for sure, that's definitely a possibility. But Federer, one of the greatest servers of all time, uses yeah. that platform. So, <laughs> yeah, that is true. Is it, I mean, is it true that uh, pinpoint stance uh, players can get higher up or anything? Like, is there any validity to that or not? Does it matter? Well, the, the idea, it doesn't really matter. But the idea is, I remember studying this. 
basically the pinpoint that I'm trying to think where it gives you the platform. I there's like a way. Let me try. I'm trying to jog my memory now. There's so many stuff I've learned over the years, but there was a benefit yeah. to both stances. But I believe the pinpoint stance either allows you to go more into the court. The platform stance drives you more up. Um, but yeah, I to be honest with you on that question on the pinpoint, I would have to do more studying again on that before I give a mm-hmm. valid answer, since I don't want to give any misinformation to viewers. Right, that's very important to me. So uh, yeah, I'd have to study more on that particular thing. Sure. Yeah, that's that makes sense, James. So, so with the toss, I mean, uh, and and I was also watching a video on that too. I mean, that's so important. And I, you know, I was playing at a, a tennis social the other day, and uh, you know, some questions on that from the players. So, um, how do you recommend that we improve our toss consistency? What can we do with it uh, for that? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. If you don't have a good ball toss, everything else is out the window. Right. But uh, yeah. The, I think the main key, the main key you've got to understand on a ball toss is we want to try and simplify the process. Uh, what do you see amongst many players? They have a lot of um, factors of which things can break down. What I mean by that is, let's say, for example, a player has a bend in the toss and arm. When they have that bend, as you can see there, now it's uh, much easier for them to activate the other movement joint, which would be the elbow and the wrist. So now uh, some players, for example, straighten the arm at the release. Other players activate the wrist in the swing. So to eliminate that, what I'd recommend is, first of all, having a straight toss arm. So you have a straight arm. And by doing that, then you've simplified the process since all you have to do is lift that arm as a unit from the shoulder in a smooth manner. So now it becomes much more easy for players to try and to coordinate. That's the first step. Now, the second step is a lot of players uh, have the basically the idea in mind that they want to throw the ball up there, throw it up. But I try and have them, I I have the idea of placing the ball up there. So it's a very smooth and relaxed manner. Uh, And the, that come down to the straight out tossing on them. What I'd recommend players do is even if they're watching this right now, stand up, start with the arm straight, touching your near your hip, very in a low position and just lift the arm as a unit from the shoulder in a smooth manner. And you can do it with a ball. Just lift the arm up to a point where the shoulder is touching the chin. Just lift it up. And when you're in this position, main, check to see if you've maintained that straight toss and arm. And just do that over and over again and feel how it's a relaxed movement. There's no jerky, sudden uh, movement in there. A lot of players have that since they start too high with the toss and arm. Uh, but that's the main thing. Number one, have that straight toss and arm. Number two, lift the arm in a smooth manner from the shoulder, maintaining that straight toss and arm. And that's really, really helped me when I was on the serve, working on the ball toss. Great stuff, James. And yeah, I guess on average, it seems like a lot of players are just tossing it too quickly. So would you maybe suggest that players kind of be as mm, maybe slow, like slow as possible or or something like that? Or Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. A lot of players have a mistake with the service rhythm. Um, so they start the motion too fast. When you start it too fast, the ball usually ends up going too high, much harder to control. So that's a great point, yes. If you start the motion slower, it gives you a lot more control on the ball toss and also it helps you with the other components of the swing if you start slower. Awesome. Thanks, James. And then so I guess, again, it's, you know, it's somewhat stylistic, but obviously it carries implications. So in terms of you know, bringing both arms, both the tossing and the hitting arms up together versus having some lag where you keep the uh, hitting arm, uh, I guess, like down a little bit, lower and it comes up like uh after the the tossing arm like what what do you suggest like in terms of like the the simplest one that facilitates the best serve uh for me i promote more of that separation between them both so you Mm -hmm. toss the ball first and you delay the hit and arm i just find that some players when they have both arms going up at the same time that's when things become very jerky and sudden they move the racket too fast uh, and that results usually in a pause in the motion. The racket has to stop now since it's moving too fast. Um, so for me, I promote more of tossing the ball first and then initiating the swing. So what we say is after you've released the ball, so you release the ball approximately eye level, after you release, then you initiate the right to left from that point. You initiate the swing. That's what we usually teach players. Mm, I like that. Very simple and effective. Uh, and, and then I guess talking more about the role of the lower body, I um, mean, obviously it can help a lot and, and, you know, with the unit turn, it's important to, to utilize it as well. So 
I guess, can you kind of describe like the main roles of, of the lower body with the surf? Yeah. Well, the, the first thing I'd um, have players uh, have in mind is when we talk a lot, a lot about jumping uh, on the serve, you want to jump for more power. Uh, I think more of terms of coiling the body, since when you coil the body, the body's going to naturally uncoil. And I always remember it, Florian talking to me. He said, if you get an elastic band, you pull it in one direction. When you let go, there's a reaction in the opposite direction. So for every reaction, uh, there's an opposite uh, reaction also. So what I tell players to do is coil the body more. But how do you do that? Well, the first step is coil the upper body against the, the hips. So you turn the shoulders past the level of the hips. So you feel a pre-stretch down the side of the body. That's the first step. And then a very good idea to have in mind with the legs is basically soften the knees. Just soften them and you feel how you go a little bit lower. And then when you do that, you feel a fully coiled position with the body. So you've turned the shoulders past the level of the hips. You've coiled the lower body. You don't want to go too low since now you have to recruit muscle in order to get back up. So you lose energy there. But then the idea is when the racket begins to move over the head, you're now in this fully coiled position. And then as the racket moves down and away, that's when you initiate from the ground up. So you fire from the right hip if you're a right-handed player, and that initiates the whole kinetic chain. Uh, but it starts from that position. So you're fully coiled here. The racket's moving over the head. When that happens, the body begins to uncoil. But for the legs and the lower body, the main thing that really helped me is focus more on coiling the body. Since if you, if you do that, the body will naturally uncoil. Yeah, that's fantastic stuff. And to your point about the timing as well, uh, you know, one of the big points I got from Rick Macy was that a lot of uh, players, they'll perform the racket drop uh, way too early and then push up with the lower body. And so that's like out of sync and that's, that's no good <laughs> yeah. in terms of yeah. power. So I'm sure you probably see that a lot. Oh yeah. It's a very big problem. Yeah, for sure. So, um, in terms of the second serve, I, I think, you know, obviously a ton of players, uh, could, could benefit from having a more consistent second serve, you know, maybe even use it sometimes on the first serve, you know, so we don't suffer so many double faults and all that. So what are some keys to developing, uh, an effective and consistent second serve? Well, one of the questions I ask myself, and you can ask yourself this also, if you're a player, what's the whole goal of the second serve? What are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to, number one, increase the upward angle of the swing since we're trying to impart more spin on the ball to give us more safety. So what's the best way to increase the upward angle of the swing? The best way, number one, is to remain more sideways. The differences in the motion itself between the first and the second serve are very, very slight. But what you'll see is the best players will stay more sideways since now that allows them to increase the upward angle of the swing. If you open up more, the swing is going to go more in the direction of the court, more forward. So by staying sideways, now you really increase the upward angle. Now, how do you get a feel for that? Well, there's many drills you can do. Uh, one of my favorites is if, you go, if you're on a tennis court and you have relatively high fences, go outside the court and serve over the fence. So now you really have to increase the upward angle around contact. Now, another way you can do that if you don't have a fence is simply do it on your knees. Make sure you put a towel down. Obviously, you don't want to hurt your knees. Uh, but just get the feeling for basically brushing up the back of the ball around contact. Really feel how you're catching the ball thin, uh, as we say. And to increase the upward angle, stay sideways. Uh, and visual, visualize also the ball flight to the ball. What are you trying to achieve? Visualize it. See it very clearly. Uh, get a very clear picture in your mind what you're trying to do. Uh, and that also helped me a lot when I was doing it. But the main key is for me is stay sideways. The more you stay sideways, the more you increase the upward angle of the swing. Yeah, thanks for that, James. And yeah, I actually uh, just interviewed uh, Vanya King, who was uh, you know, top three in the world in doubles, top 15 singles. And, you know, one of her coaches, uh, one of the best drills that uh, she did for a kick serve was just simply what you said was just, um, you know, serving fr from her, I think, knees or sitting down, one of those, mm -hmm. just forcing you to, to hit that, that kick there to get over the net. So a little more uh, over rotation. I mean, I, that's obviously very, very important for the second serve, but is that also pretty important for even the first serve in terms of like, you know, a lot of players will like rotate too early and lose power on, on any serve? Yeah, that's a, a very common problem on all serves. Uh, and I think the, the reason why it's a problem is we watch the pros on television and the naked eye can't pick up what's going on through contact. Since they swing with so much racket head speed, all you see is the finished position where they've completely opened up. 
but that's just forces acting upon their body. Since they swim with so much racket head speed, they naturally un uncoil. That's a natural reaction. But if you slow the motion down very closely, this is applies for the slice serve, the kick serve, and the first serve, flat serve. If you slow it down, you actually see that around contact, their body completely stops the non-hidden side of the body. And what happens is Vic Braden did studies and he found that if you stop the non-hidden side of the body at the right time before contact, the hidden side can accelerate at one and a half times faster. That's what they wow. found with studies. So you basically, they call it posting. You post one side of the body and the other side can accelerate much faster. So to do that, we just have players exaggerate it. So let's say you're a player who opens up too much. Now we've got to exaggerate in the opposite direction and we have you remain completely sideways. So we don't have you look where the ball is going, since that's one of the main reasons. Players want to see where the ball goes, so their head shifts. And if the head goes, the swing is going to follow. So, And then we have them hold the finish. Very, very important. If you're working on over-rotation, hold the finish, and at the end, see where your upper body is pointing. If your upper body is completely opened up, then you know you've done something wrong. If, the upper body, if you're a right-handed player and the upper body is pointing towards the right net post, then you've done something right. And one great way to do that is make sure you keep the toss arm, keep control of the toss arm, keep it tucked into the body and hold the finish where you finish arm over arm. So it's like a, you're completing a letter X when you finish, just like so. Very, very important for over rotation. Very nice, James. Very nice. So I mean, we've covered a lot of great stuff on the serve, thanks to you. And so how would you kind of go about overall, you know, in deciding uh you know what area of the serve to start with and then like you know figuring out like how much they need you need to practice for that like maybe just a, a overview of you know a process for for changing technique yeah that's a great question since um our whole objective as a coach is uh we don't want to overcomplicate it for a player uh, and that's when it, that's a, basically a good uh, deceptor between a good coach and a not so great coach since if you overload the player's brain with too many things now they scramble. They don't know what to do and everything just breaks down. So the whole objective for us is we have to identify the number one thing on your serve that needs to be fixed, uh, that once fixed is going to give you the most amount of results in the shortest period of time. So for it's different for everyone. It's very personalized. So let's say, for example, you are focusing, let's say on the racket drop. You're focusing on getting into the racket drop. So how do you go about changing it? One of the most important things that helped me a lot, uh, I completely rebuilt my whole serve. I started with no serve at all. Uh, and it took me a long time. That's one thing. The first thing you have to keep in mind is it's a long-term process. There's no overnight success, overnight pill, magic pill you can take. You do have to commit yourself to going through the steps. And that's very, very important. But what I can say on that, if you do commit yourself to going through the steps and the progressions, pretty much anything is possible. If you've got two arms, two legs, then you can do it. That's what I always say. Uh, but change in technique, how do you do it? You really have to break it down into what we call micro progressions. One of the biggest mistakes I see players make is let's say you're working on the racket drop. What's the first thing we all want to do? We go straight out on the tennis court, go to the baseline and try and execute it serving into the service box. And it just completely breaks down. Why? As soon as you release that ye little yellow ball, your focus has shifted onto number one, making contact with the ball and number two onto the outcome. Was it good? Was it powerful? Was it in? Was it out? And as soon as you do that, you've detracted your focus from the mechanics you're trying to work on. And it's very natural. So what we have to do is we have to break the whole swing down and isolate it to give your brain the opportunity to process this new information. So how do you do that? The first step is we have players go inside the court, inside the baseline, and serve down the line. Now we take the outcome completely out of the equation. You've got no outcome to contend with. That's number one. The second thing is we isolate the swing. So we start in that half serve position, just like so. So we isolate the swing, makes it a lot easier for players. And then another really great one that helped me is, let's say that even players who do that, they go inside the court, they isolate the swing. What's the next thing they do, which can be detrimental? They just hit balls over and over and over and over again. So they may not be aware that they're reinforcing bad habits. Uh, so what I always recommend players do is start with a rotation of two shut excuse me, two shadow swings, one hit. Two shadow swings, one hit. And by doing the two shadow swings after every, every hit, you're basically reinforcing the new mechanics. So now you're not reinforcing any bad habits. Very, very important. And then you build it up one step further. So now once that's natural, you do one shadow swing, one hit. One shadow, one hit. And then in the last stage, I recommend players do two hits, one shadow. So you slowly build it up in a step-by-step -step manner. 
And then all you do is you move it back to the baseline, still serving down the line. So as you can see, it's a very simple and step-by-step -step manner. But that's one of the keys to making any technical change. Uh, I promise you, if you go back to the baseline and try to execute it, uh, serving from the baseline into the service box, it's not going to work. You really have to break it down and isolate it. Very, very important. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, so many years, maybe decades of a particular technique. You know, you've got to, got to go in progression. Yeah. So, so question for you: Say if you have multiple phases of the serve that are, you know, have some wonks and or problems with it. So, like, let's say, let's say your right to left is off. Um, it's incorrect. And then also your racket drop and, you know, uh, elbow action is incorrect. So do you, should you not like hit the ball basically because you have both of those wrong? Like, should you just practice the right to left until you get that, uh, and it's natural. And, and then like, once that's like a hundred percent there, then you can go to the racket drop and hitting the ball. Yeah. That's a, that's a great, that's a great question. Yeah. The, yeah. If you, if you have, let's say you have that, you don't have a good right to left, you don't have a good racket drop and so forth, so you have a lot of things um, out yeah. of sync, the first step would definitely be to master it in the shadow swing. Um, I always re refer it back to martial arts. What do they do all the time? They shadow movement. They shadow the movements over and over again until they get the basic understanding of what they're trying to do. Since if you can't execute it in the shadow swing, very unlikely you'll do it when the ball is added to the equation. So, yeah, that's the first step. But then... Uh, what I recommend you do is if you have like three or four things that are out of sync, make sure you only focus on one at a time. Isolate one since as soon as we try to incorporate a lot at once, your brain will just go on autopilot and you'll revert back to what you know. So just focus on one thing and that would be for me the right to left. If you haven't got a good racket drop or even if the ball toss is out of sync, uh, then you've got to isolate the components one step at a time. Trying to coordinate all at the same time, it will break down. Yeah. Very, very difficult to do that. I've tried. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, um, in terms of the, the slicer, I'm curious, um, if you have any tips on how we can get a better feel of, of really generating that, uh, that slice. Yeah. There's, um, one of the, the ideas you want to have in mind, this is where it comes into over rotation. Players think that to get the ball going, uh, let's say you're a right-handed player in the deuce court to get the ball going out wide. They think they got to open up the body to really get the ball out wide. But basically, all you have to do is you have to contact more of the right edge of the ball. So you really, to, so to exaggerate that, what we actually have players do is first step you can do is hit the ball with the edge of the racket. Since in order to uh, hit a slice serve, you must lead with the edge of the racket. Now that does come down to the grip also. If you have an incorrect grip, very difficult to do that. But the first step is you have to lead with the edge in order to hit a slice serve. So the first step would be to hit the ball with the edge of the racket. It's an exaggeration, or it's very good. The second step then would be to hit the ball, the right edge of the ball, really exaggerate it. And the ball will fly out to the left. You won't hit it very clean, but get the idea for catching the ball very thin on the right edge. So you're not changing anything with the body. You're not changing anything with the swing. Everything is the same. All you're doing is changing the racket angle uh, face at contact. Now, what does that also do to you? It gives you more disguise. If you're hitting a slice serve out wide and you open up the body to do it, players are going to read it. They're going to know, okay, he's going to hit the slice serve. I can read it. So by doing that, maintaining everything else the same, but just changing the racket angle at contact, uh, it's going to give you more disguise. But that's one of the best ways to do it is, number one, you have to lead with the edge of the racket. It's very important. But number two, really try and catch the ball uh, thinly on the right. And I remember Greg working with me on this, actually, uh, in London. And he actually had me trying to hit the doubles tram line first. So you really exaggerate it, get the ball going out wide, and then you slowly move it back in. So you exaggerate it, as we, we always talk about exaggerating the correction. So you exaggerate out, uh, missing wide completely, and then you slowly from there, you bring it back in. But the best tip I can give is just go out there and really try and catch the ball thin on the right edge, leading with the edge of the racket. Mm, great way to conceptualize it. So I guess, you know, so this question, the, the answer to it has a potential to bring up, you know, uh, some points that you've made earlier, which is totally fine. It's good to reiterate. Um, but, you know, a lot of times you'll see players who are in a pretty good uh, trophy position, but, you know, one player will get a huge pop on to serve. Another player, you know, won't get much on it at all, even though they seemingly look like they're both in pretty good trophy position. So what are some of the things that can go wrong, you know, after the trophy position that really rob you of the most power? 
Okay, yeah, it's a great question. Well, the first thing you've got to always check is when we talk about the trophy position, you have to keep in mind that it's a dynamic position. It's not a static position. Uh, when we talk about, okay, you want to get into the trophy pose, what does it sound like you want to get into? So players get there and they stop. And that's a problem then. As soon as we stop the swing, you've now broken all the moment momentum and racket head speed. So now you have to recruit muscle again in order to reaccelerate the racket. And that's when things break down. That's when you have these hitches, the racket face opens from that point, and a lot of things do break down. So that's the first step. Make sure that you move through the trophy position. You don't stay there. That's the first step. Now, the second step is you also want to make sure that from this position, when the racket is above the head, you want to really allow the racket head to basically drop down and away from the body. So you can actually get into this position with the racket and basically let the weight of the racket head take over. Don't do it with a ball. Just do it in the shadow swing and feel how the weight of the racket head drops down and away. A lot of players from this position, they swing directly up to contact with the hand from this point. But you want to let the elbow lead and basically let the hand fall down and away from the body. Allow this movement to happen. Very important. Since a lot of players, they get this, so they get the racket moving right to left, they get into this position, but then from there, they just go up to contact. They don't complete the full right to left. So that's also a very important point. Got it. Awesome. Appreciate that. In terms of um, books, because uh, you know you've studied so much, and I know a lot of it has been video content and, and things like that, and, and uh, physical locations. But uh, are there three books that you would gift a friend to help them improve their tennis game? First one has to be uh, Tennis Two Thousand, Vic Braden, one hundred percent. Definitely get that. There's the other one. Give me one second. I got all my bookshelf here. Let me get it. Sure got to remember the name of it here yeah? where is it there it is secret of a true tennis master by welby van horn very very good oh. book i'd recommend you get that also uh, and then the other book for me let's think what other book would i recommend you get for me it would probably be another vic braden book um i believe it's called mental tennis that's what it's called by vic braden and it's an mm. excellent book there's some great stories about rod laver in there um and it really goes into more detail on the mind the mind is so important especially when you're working on technique uh, the mind can really mess you up uh, so those are the three i'd recommend tennis 2000 vic braden uh, secrets of a true tennis master well be van horn and then mental tennis by vic braden also very nice i appreciate that i guess um pivoting back to the serve again um i guess any thoughts on uh the